We're doing a Twitter Thursday on the Spy Week. Your questions coming up next. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to a special edition of the Locked On Giants podcast. We are doing a Twitter Thursday. Now, normally in season, we do our crossover show on Thursday, but because we are on a bye week, we have moved the mailbag to Thursday and happy to be here with you. Happy to answer your questions. As always, we just have a few this week but we're going to get to all of them on this episode. And this episode, by the way, is brought to you in part by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's is the place to go to recharge, reconnect, and enjoy an endless tasty supply of French fries. Whatever you're feeling, McDonald's probably has it, regardless of your dietary needs or whatnot. Check them out today. McDonald's, I'm loving it. All right, we are going to get to your questions. We have about six, so we'll do a couple per segment here, and um, then we will uh, call it a show. So let's get into your questions. We're going to start with the email questions received first, and this first one came from Dave P., who wants to know, as we get wins against the Raiders team, that went through a lot on their bye week, a bad quarterback with the Panthers, et cetera. My concern is and always has been that Marin Tish will use these games to justify not making changes and keeping things status quo. Um, again, will Mara and Tish use these schemes in 2022 and will we be in the same boat? All right, Dave, thank you for that question. Um, I do not think that regardless of what happens at the end of the year, things will stay status quo. There are a couple of things that I could see realistically happening. Number one, I would not be totally stunned if there are some changes made to the assistant coaching staff, right? I don't think Joe Judge is in jeopardy of being um, fired, but as I've said, uh, as I probably have noted before, some of those assistant coaches, their contracts, I think, are coming up, um, or the end of their contracts, I should say, are coming up. So I could see scenarios where certain people are not renewed on both sides of the ball, by the way. So that's one move I would think to keep an eye on. And actually, this is um, another email that I got that I was going to answer later on, but um, I might as well lump it in here. I am not 100% certain that Dave Gettleman is back next year, all right, regardless of what happens. And here's my thinking on this. Obviously, if the Giants do worse record-wise than they did last year, that's a no-brainer. Gettleman, I, I, I don't see him lasting. Um, if the Giants do go to the playoffs, I could see a potential case of where um, – the Giants and Gettleman mutually part ways. In other words, Gettleman basically says, okay, look, we got you to the playoffs. Good luck. I'm retiring. I'm going to Cape Cod. I'm going to watch you from my, from my beach house and, and, you know, Godspeed. I think, you know, if I had to put odds down and this is answers the other question that I got that I was going to say for later in the show, but if I had to take a guess and put odds down, I would say I'm probably leaning towards 60% that Gettleman is not back next year. And um, look, you've got to look at, at the bottom line here. The offensive line is not fixed, all right? Despite what the team says, the offensive line is not fixed. They don't have enough depth. And I'm actually working on an article for uh, Giants Country. Matter of fact, I think that article probably dropped today or it will drop today, depending on when you're watching this podcast, um, in which I talk about the offensive line. And uh, the article is just basically comparing the mistakes made by Dave Gettleman to the mistakes made by Jerry Reese. And the article, um, it's a comparison because there are several mistakes that I see the two of them having made. And I talk about that. And one of them is the offensive line. Um, Dave did not do enough, plain and simple. It's okay, you know, that they had confidence in the guys that they had, but 
there was another factor that I think Dave came up short in. And it's the same thing Jerry came up short in. And I don't want to spoil the article, the crux of the article. So I hope you will check that out. That'll be on Giants Country. And I think that article is dropping 10 o'clock on uh, Thursday morning. But um, that in itself, the point being is, is the offensive line has been a problem. It's been a problem for four years and not enough was done. And that's just not, you know, that that's unforgivable. I mean, Gettleman came in and talked about fixing that offensive line. It's not fixed. And I'm not just talking the starters. I'm talking the depth. So let's let's be clear there. So um, that would be probably uh, what I would suspect. That's a long answer, I know. But in terms of, you know, are the Giants going to make changes? I, I think regardless of what happens, you will see changes at the end of the year. I don't think the Giants will stand pat. Thanks for that question. Okay, up next, we have another email question. This comes from Matt L., who wrote me a very nice letter. Thank you, Matt, for the kind words you sent. And his question is, um, let's see, considering that for the past two years under Coach Judge, the Giants have started off slowly, but then seem to get their sea legs under them. What do you think Coach Judge could, should, or will change in his approach to preseason to ensure that instead of an 0-3 start, they actually win some games in the first quarter of the season? All right, thanks for that question, Matt. I've said this before, and I believe this will change because uh, I think Judge has learned that you can't, you know, this isn't New England, this isn't Alabama. You cannot waste time in the preseason, all right? You only have so many practices, you only have so many preseason games. So to sit there and kick back and say, okay, I'm not going to play my starters until the third preseason game when I'm going to do the dress rehearsal. I'm sorry, that's arrogance. And that's just over evaluating or overvaluing what you had. Now I get it. This the flip side of the argument and in defense of judge, he probably thought, okay, well, we've got guys who are injured. You know, why put Daniel out there, for example, without Kenny Galladay, without Saquon, you know, without Kyle Rudolph? I get that thinking. But guess what? This season, Daniel has had to play without Saquon. He has had to play without Kenny Galladay. So what favors did Judge do if that indeed was his thinking? None. So the point is, is you've got to learn to play with other people, not just the guys who are your intended starters, because you never know when injuries are going to strike you down. And I think Judge really misjudged that whole uh, scenario. The other thing in keeping with that, The Giants team, this is a Giants team that's a little different, Heck, make that a lot different than from the teams maybe Judge was exposed to in Alabama and New England. Those teams could afford to throw away the first game or two or three of the season because they were good enough to make up for it down the line. This Giants team this year was not. So you cannot take that one size of Uh, fits all approach, which is what judge did. I think in this instance, he basically, you know, he talked about how, you know, the first month of of the season was uh, an extension of, of the uh, preseason. No, it's not. Those games count. So I think that's probably where you're going to see a big change next year. If you're judge, you don't wait until the third preseason game to put everybody on the field and see what, how everything looks. You know, I don't want to hear that, oh, they practice well, they got enough quality time in practice, especially when he goes and he admits that you can't simulate game scenarios and game speed in practice. It just never made sense to me. And it drove me crazy. And um, again, there's a lot of things that Joe Judge says and does that I agree with. This one, I did not. And I think this one came back to bite them. So Again, a long-winded answer, but I hope that answers your question. Thank you again for the kind words and for the question. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's show. But first, just a reminder that this episode is brought to you in part by McDonald's, serving proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It is a place where friends, family, community can get together, recharge, reconnect, and enjoy an endless tasty supply 
uh, French fries. Make sure you check out your local McDonald's today. They're sure to have something on their menu that will satisfy just about any diet, any taste. McDonald's, I'm loving it. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's show. But first, if you do a lot of driving like I do, then you need to know about a fantastic new app called Get Upside. When you open an account on Get Upside, you can get 25 cents back per gallon every time you fill up at the pump. Get Upside makes it easy to save on all your gasoline fill ups, and they give you multiple cash out options such as direct payment to your bank account, PayPal, Amazon gift cards, and more. And they're available anytime you want to cash out. Open an account today and use our special promo code TOUCHDOWN and you will get a bonus 25 cents back per gallon on your first fill up. That's 50 cents back when you open an account on the Get Upside app and use our special promo code TOUCHDOWN. So check it out. Get Upside is available on the iTunes store and on Google Play. And our special promo code again is touchdown. All right, Giant fans, you've got a Twitter Thursday on today's Locked on Giants podcast. Patricia Trana here with you. Thank you so much for tuning in. And those for you wondering, yes, we are going to do a show tomorrow. We will have a show for you on Friday. Um, Still working out the details. Unfortunately, I was hoping to tape the show Wednesday night, got hung up, had to stay late at the office, but uh, it's okay. We're getting caught up. So um, I will have something for you. And then we'll just pick up where with the usual schedule on Monday. So let's get back to your questions. I have one more from the email collection, and then we'll get into the actual tweets. And from the email, we hear from John G, who writes, I noticed that running back Wayne Gallman and offensive tackle Jackson Barton we're both inactive week nine. Are there any former Giants who have been receiving a lot of playing time this year and playing well? If yes, who? Dalvin Tomlinson? That comes, he, he comes to mind. Um, trying to think if there's anybody else. Who else did they lose via free agency? Tomlinson for sure. Um, I think that's it. I want to say that's it. But uh, yeah. To answer your question, Tomlinson, I mean, Gallman, you're talking about a guy who was always like an RB2. Um, Barton was practice squad, and then he was signed by the Raiders to their, you know, off the practice squad to the 53. So he he would have been like an OT, like three. So um, Tomlinson, you know, he's a DT1. So, uh, you know, I know it's, I don't know if you meant, you know, were there any giants who, who maybe weren't necessarily starters but that's the answer i came up with so hope that's uh that satisfies the question thanks john for that question all right folks let's now turn to the twitter questions and uh let me go ahead and pull up the first one all right so the first question from twitter comes from tim nyg tim what are some offensive philosophy I'm sorry, what are some offensive philosophies the Giants need to implement to score more points? Wow. Uh, Tim, you know, this is an interesting question. Um, I think in the Raiders game, we actually saw some of the philosophies that work, you know, such as getting Evan Ingram down the field as opposed to on those short stick routes. But here's the other thing with, um, with the Giants. They need to be able to move the chains, whether it's via the run or via the pass. And with the passing game, guys need to get open. This is all about one-on-one matchups. And if guys aren't getting open, then, you know, the, you're going to see the Giants dink and dunk their way down the field. So I, I don't know that there's any, like, changes to philosophy that they have to make because it varies according to each team. But, um, you know, the offensive line, uh, the pass protection has been okay. It hasn't been great at times. So that has, you know, necessitated or reduced, I should say, the number of times they take deep shots down the field. Um, running the game, you know, running the ball, obviously that's, that's a big one. Um, it would be nice to have Saquon Barkley back because Saquon's really the only guy I think who can exploit the edges in the run game. I don't think that's really... Devonta Booker's uh, strength. So, um, yeah, uh, 
They've used a lot of heavy personnel packages, which I've liked. Heavy personnel being 12 and and 13 and 23 personnel. And that for those of you who don't who aren't familiar with the numbers, 12 personnel is one back, two tight ends, uh, 13 is one back, three tight ends, and 23 is two backs, three tight ends. And um, those heavy, they're, they're called heavy packages because they're the bigger guys that are on the field. So yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to really, you know, pin it down and say they should do this definitively the rest of the way because it's going to vary according to opponent. But the big thing is matchups and just finding a way to get these receivers open. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask about route concepts. And at the end of the day, it's just, you know, how they're designing to get things done. You know, are they doing rub routes? A rub route being when, you know, one receiver goes this way and then another one kind of goes this way and rubs off of maybe this guy so they can do rub routes because that's that's kind of like um, – that creates confusion for, I think, the defense. Um, play action is another thing they could do. And uh, taking deep shots selectively. So those are some of the things I think they could do if they want to open things up down the field. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on today's show. But first, did you know betonline.ag is back better and bigger than ever before, offering a new web interface for basketball season and more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the basketball and football action this season. And uh, head on over to their update, updated uh, desktop or mobile site and sign up for your new account and you will get a 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit when you use our promo code Locked On. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, UFC, right down to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers that are available. Head on over to betonline.ag. It is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online where the game begins. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. Patricia Trainer here with you. We are doing a Twitter Thursday. Not a lot of questions this week. I guess a lot of you checked out for the bye week. I know I'm going to check out for the bye week and enjoy the weekend off, a rare week, weekend off, and hope you guys and gals are planning to do the same. Or if you're going to be watching football, that you can kick back and relax and not get aggravated or too elated either way. Um, let's get back to these last remaining questions that we have. Uh, we're going to kick one off with uh, George Grossi, G- at G. Grossi Law, who writes, with the weakness in the O-line, call me crazy, but why not on certain plays put a tight end or extra lineman actually in the backfield? Um, a step or two behind the normal lineman and to the side of the quarterback could pick up a rusher who's already beaten a lineman. George, they've kind of done something to, along those lines. They've, they've, as I mentioned in the last segment, they've made use last week against the Raiders with heavy personnel packages. And, you know, with an, with a lineman, um, you have to have that guy be declared as eligible. As you know, they, you can't just, put an offensive lineman in the backfield and not have him declared eligible to touch the ball. That's when they say, you know, receiver eligible, he has to be eligible to to touch the ball. Um, They have, I I think, you know, in terms of putting them in the backfield, those guys aren't exactly explosive, you know, because remember you've got faster guys up front, you know, on the defense. So a faster edge rusher who's firing into the backfield, and an offensive lineman, they're not exactly known for speed and explosion. So putting them in the backfield and asking them to take a running start to meet another guy who's you know faster than them, I, I'm not so sure that's a recipe for success. So what the Giants have been doing is they've been putting, uh, or at least what they did last week, I should say, they put Corey Cunningham, an offensive tackle, as an inline blocker. They did, had him declare as eligible. So that gives them, you know, that gave them 13 personnel. They had the two tight ends on the field and um, that's how they've been doing it. So, you know, to put an offensive lineman in the backfield, again, unless that guy has speed and explosion, which I don't think a lot of these guys on the team do, it's not really a good idea. So hope that answers your question. Thank you for that. And let's get to our final question. 
This one is from uh, Lenny De La Cruz, De La Cruz 7. Okay, Lenny De La Cruz 7. What are some of the reasons for keeping Jason Garrett? All right, Lenny, I'm not sure if you mean at this moment or after at the end of the season, but I'll try and cover both for you. Number one, it, you want to keep the system uh, consistent, meaning that if you get rid of Jason Garrett and you start from scratch, you're going to ask Daniel Jones to undo a lot of what he did, especially if you get an offensive coordinator who has a totally different um perspective on how to do things. I think if Jason Garrett moves on, um, what you might see is Freddie Kitchens get promoted to establish that continuity. In other words, keep the same system, but just get a different play caller in there. Um, number two, to fire Jason Garrett now, again, you know, why, why upheave that? You know, you're, you're halfway through the season. All right. I get it at times, Garrett, has been boring. His his schemes have left you, you scratching your head. Garrett's just got to get better. And to be honest with you, and I and I hate to use this as an excuse or as a reason, but this offense, as you know, hasn't been complete. They've been missing playmakers left and right all season. They are missing offensive linemen, which is a problem. So when you don't have that continuity. How is somebody supposed to know what they have? All right. It's kind of like, you know, at Giants Country, I have a team of about uh, three or four writers. And I know on game day who's going to do what. But if, you know, those writers came back to me and they said, oh, you know, I'm not going to be available this week. I'm not going to be available. I can't plan accordingly. Now I have to scramble and figure out how I'm going to make up for the, for, you know, somebody who might not be available or who, who maybe, you know, doesn't want to do a particular article. So I can understand the, the issue or the challenge, I should say, that Jason Garrett is experiencing. Um, now you're probably going to sit there and you're going to say, well, good coaches figure it out. They find a way and they earn their money. You're absolutely right. They do. But um you got to have personnel backing these guys up that are worth it, to, that you can count on, that you can fall back on. And I don't think the Giants have fully have the personnel they need. You know, coach says next man up. They say that all the time. But let's look at the running back for, for a, a, a moment here. All right. Saquon Barkley has a unique set of uh, skills. Devon the Booker is a good running back. But he's not a guy who's going to threaten the edges. His strength is running between the tackles. Barkley's strength might be threatening the edges. So you see this whole next man up concept, this whole you know line that coaches feed us. It's not true. These guys aren't robot. It isn't like oh you know uh, this 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 robot broke. So let's put this robot in. That's not how this works. So a coach has to figure out okay. What do guys do well? And how can we use that within our overall game plan? And Jason does come up short once in a while with that, but um, it's gotten a little bit better, I think. I think he's, you know, he's, he's kind of gotten a little bit more creative these last couple of weeks. Still room to grow, but, uh, but yeah, I, I don't get the sense that Joe Judge is going to make it, uh, a switch. I know he's, he was asked about it. And he basically said, you know, there are no plans to do that at this time. So, you know, Jason, he's going to ride it out the rest of this year. And then we'll see what happens after this year. Will he be amongst the assistant coaches that I believe might be uh, replaced if their contracts are up? We will see. We'll find out. All right, Giant fans, that's going to do it for this edition of the Lock on Giants podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, everybody. Again, we will be back tomorrow with another show. It'll probably be a short show, but we'll we'll send you into the weekend with uh, one last show. And, uh, you know, then hope hopefully everybody will enjoy the weekend. And then we're back on Monday with our regular schedule. So until then, everybody have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.